Tastemakers was funded in part by... In the hands of those who take pride in what they do, something unique can be created. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. And by Fleischmann's Yeast. And A.B. Maori. I'm standing in the middle of oil country, but not the kind of oil you're probably thinking of. In this episode of Tastemakers, come along with me to rural Georgia and get a taste of artisan oils that are made with nuts and seeds grown right here. I'm Kat Neville, and I've been telling the story of local food for about 20 years. In that time, I've seen the American food movement explode in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. From deep frying to drizzling on a salad, oil is a critical component in cooking, but there's a world of flavor to explore beyond standard EVOO. So in this episode of Tastemakers, you are going to meet Clay Oliver. He's the man behind Oliver Farms, and his oils have become one of the most sought after ingredients in the South. This is some family land that's been in our family for many generations. Historically, the farm's been a row crop farm, growing various crops that, you know, we can grow here in South Georgia, from peanuts, one of our main staples, a little corn. We grow the majority of our acres in cotton. The idea of doing oil came about over a period of time. 2008 was a very pivotal year for us. In the spring, the day before we were to begin planting cotton that year, my daddy passed away suddenly with a heart attack. My brother, Clint, and my mother, Jerice, and I, you know, we kept things going and we weathered that storm. During the fall, the economy started tanking. People were losing jobs, fuel skyrocketed, and we were paying over $4 a gallon for off-road diesel fuel. And there was a lot of talk about alternative fuels on uh, TV and in other media. And I was like, you know, maybe that's something we could do is, you know, make our own fuel on the farm. So I began just researching people, looking up machinery, trying to learn as much as I could about the process. I met a guy online named Glenn Rhodes who lives in Virginia. Uh, he grows canola, converts it into biofuel. I said, can I just look at what you're doing to see if I could do it? And he said, sure, come on. And I went, drove up one winter and looked at it, and he just happened to say, let me show you what my nephew's doing. And he showed me a small food grade uh, press that he was making, small scale, and I said, light bulb, you know, that's what I could do. Sunflowers are what started it all. Back in 2012, Clay planted a big plot of these bright, sunny flowers with the intention of making oil. The move to making food grade oil came gradually. I don't think I said, well, I'm going to make culinary oils and gourmet oils. It was just one of those things you get led, you know, and doors open and somebody calls and says this or, you know, I read something and it's like, hmm, well, let me check that out, you know. I bought some expensive seed, planted sunflowers in the spring of 2012. We're standing right in the middle of one of these sunflower fields, and Clay is gonna tell us about this amazing flower. It is really just an interesting plant. Yeah, the more I learn about the sunflower, the more I'm just intrigued by it and just in awe of its beauty. The seeds are actually forming underneath all of these flowers. That's right, yeah, this gray clear area there, mm -hmm. those are seeds beginning to form. 
And is there a specific variety of sunflowers? Are there different kinds? Yeah, there are a lot of different varieties and kinds. Um, most people are familiar with the Can You Buy at the Bird Feed Store, and those are pyridovic sunflowers. They have oil in them, uh, but it's, it, it's not as high uh, content of oil. What we do is purchase high oleic sunflower seeds. The oil has a guaranteed percentage of 80% or more being high oleic. It's more shelf stable. Uh, it's got a better saturated fat content in it, actually lower than olive oil. Oh, wow. Uh, so a really healthy oil to use as well. There are a lot of people that do uh, different types of oils. Most of it's mass produced in large scale, and, and that's what I had to educate myself on. I learned the difference between processing and, you know, this totally unrefined oil, and I was just blown away. I was like, hey, this stuff goes through, you know, uh, some pretty harsh handling, and they use some means that aren't, uh, you know, as clean as, you know, just us. We don't do anything to it. We just uh, leave the oil in its natural state. We don't do anything but crush the seeds. We clean it to get anything out that's not oil, and then we bottle it. I'm just glad to find a, uh, you know, a way to put something out there that's a little cleaner and healthier that we as Americans, I think, just don't think about. We want convenience, we want quick, uh, cheap, fill me up. And you know, I just like the whole idea of the slow food movement, knowing where your food comes from. It should taste like what it says on the label. I, I never dreamed I would be passionate about those things, but I am now. Clay's oils are cold pressed and unrefined and everything is done in this small building right here on the farm. So let's get inside and see how the magic happens. We're standing in the oil shop and Clay just a couple of minutes ago started running these sunflower seeds which are whole through, what is this called, an extractor? A uh, screw press. A screw press, of That's course. one word for you. And you just were checking the temperature. Yes. And why does the temperature matter? At certain temperatures, the oil begins to break down. And it, it is detrimental to the flavor for the, you know, the whole fat profile of the oil. So you don't want to damage the oil in any way. So that's what we try to do by, you know, not getting it very hot, going slow, taking our time, it leaves a, just a quality difference that you can taste. How does it actually work? Like, what is it pushing these seeds against to extract this oil? Well, you have an electric motor to turn the gear head, and then the screw, which is turned by that, pushes the commodity into, a, we call it a crush plate. It's specifically made out of very, very hard metal, and it has a design in the end that forces the commodity to begin working its way down. What was it like the first time you put one of these things through a press? Were you amazed? What did you feel when you kind of like did that for the first time? Pretty disappointed because I couldn't get it to work. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, I wasn't sure how to turn it on. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's no instructions with it. How long did it take you to get to the point where you knew what you were actually doing? I still don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I don't think he's going to brag on himself, but out in his office, there are entire walls full of awards that you have won and places that you've gone, photos of your family with Alice Waters, good food awards. I mean, this really has connected with the culinary community in a really interesting way, and you've been able to just meet so many people across the country who are interested in the work that you're doing. Who knew, right? I mean, I'm one of hundreds and thousands of folks who put their heart and soul into making what they believe in. So connecting with them has been super fun and uh, it's been an amazing journey. How about a taste of fresh sunflower oil? It's amazing that this is the result of those gorgeous flowers that we just saw out in the field. Mm -hmm. It's so gentle and it has really just kind of delicate flavor. Mm -hmm. Straight 
水分病毒。So we started with the sunflower oil, and it was like a no-brainer to try peanuts. We're right here in peanut country, and uh, my brother Clint was like, "Man, if you can make oil out of pecans," he said, "You will be on to something." He said, "Because that's something nobody really does," and he said, "You know, they're so good." Gradually, people would say something or mention a different oil, or you go somewhere and I'd see a, a different type of oil, and I'd say, "Hey, you know, I'm gonna try the okra seed oil." I didn't know what to expect if people would like okra seed oil, but we've had a great response from it. Benny seed oil, love it. It was actually Thomas Jefferson's favorite oil. I've tried coriander seed oil, which is a new one. I'm really excited about it. During the fall, we said one year, it was like, hey, let's try some pumpkin seed. First, it was seasonal, and now the demand has been uh, increased so that we try to keep pumpkin oil in stock at all times. Making flour out of the byproduct came about after a year or two of being in the business and having this expelled commodity, defatted meal, if you will, come out. And we we're able to get the expelled meal really, really dry, grinding it down to get it to really fine consistency. Lends itself to some tremendous pastry applications or substitutes for other flours to give it that southern twist and you know great flavor. The flowers are tremendous in that they're naturally gluten-free. They're very high protein. Uh, I like to eat it because it tastes good. Uh, I mean, pecan flour brownies, pancakes, pumpkin flour cookies. Flowers are really cool to play with. We are here in Atlanta to check in with Steven Satterfield, the 2017 Best Chef Southeast winner from the James Beard Awards. Let's go inside and chat with him. The best way to describe what we do with the food at Miller Union is we use southern ingredients but in a fresh new way. And we're really responding to what is happening locally on the farm. I remember when I first got introduced to Clay, we got connected and got some samples, and I just became a big fan immediately. The sunflower oil, it's rich, but it's also light. I really like to use it in a salad dressing in the same way that you would just use a vegetable oil, but it adds a ton more flavors. We're gonna do a shrimp salad with the sunflower oil and make a vinaigrette out of that, and it has toasted sunflower seeds, a little cucumber, and citrus. Green peanut oil is pressed from the freshly dug peanuts. It has a very specific flavor. You can definitely taste peanut, but it's not like that roasted, sweet kind of peanut flavor. It's a little more vegetal. And so I really wanted to sort of play on the idea of a bean salad. It's really just an exploration of all these different forms of legumes. You have the fresh green peanut that we boil, we have the butter beans or field peas that are blanched, and then you have the pressed oil and then those toasted peanuts on top. The pecan oil is probably my favorite out of all of them. It has a sweetness to it that comes through. We're gonna make basically a pecan butter or pecan puree with toasted pecans and the oil and a few other ingredients, and then do a little farro salad with peach and celery and some grilled quail on top. We live here in the rural south, so we get local fresh food. It's not really that big an issue here. I mean, we live in God's country. So to be exposed to people who live in large urban areas that don't have that access and have never seen the things that we see and take for granted has been a huge uh, you know, opportunity to educate them as well that, you know, we're not just around here flying airplanes and spraying and killing everything, you know. We're stewards of the land. I mean, without it, we don't, you know, survive. I'm gonna hop in the truck with Shane Rhodes. He is a local farmer here in Pitts, Georgia that grows peanuts, pecans, and other wonderful things like watermelons. Let's take a tour.
All right, Shane and I are about to take a tour of RNS Farm. And how many generations of your family? I am the sixth generation. Sixth generation. Uh, oh, so it, it started way back in, uh, I guess, the 1860s, maybe, so roughly. So uh, we've been here a little bit and, and still trying to figure it out, so. <laughs> we'll ride through the orchard first. Perfect. I tell you what's funny about this place. This soil was not really good for growing anything else. We have a, a bunch of uh, lime rock and big rock right under the dirt. And so we could never grow. My great grandfather tried for years to grow cotton, peanut, your staple crops, and never had much luck with it. And uh, he told my grandfather, he, he said, look, if you'll plant pecan trees on, I'll give it to you. And that's how we wound up with a pecan orchard. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's been good for them. And so, have you had a chance to try Clay's oil? I have, yes. We get it all the time. Uh, me and my wife keep some at the house all the time. Does it surprise you? Because I mean, I'm sure normally you eat the pecans like in a pie or in breads or oh, something Oh, we do. Like I that. always joke that when pecan season starts, I'll gain 15 pounds from walking <laughs> up here just cracking them by hand and eating them. Man. Oh, they're delicious. My favorite at Thanksgiving is pecan pie. Oh, sure. I'm like, you can have all the fruit pies I want, <laughs> the pecan pie or the pumpkin pie. Oh, good. Those are my favorites. So I'm keeping you in business. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Keep buying them. We need it. So peanuts are very interesting, aren't they? They kind of start out on the top and they dig down into the soil. They are. Peanuts are an interesting crop. And Georgia is, of course, kind of the heart of the peanut industry in North America. It's something that's been growing around here for forever. And the smell of that fresh dirt and peanuts is addictive. One of the great things about this business has allowed us the opportunity to work with family a little more, especially my wife, Valerie. How did you and Clay meet? We were taking typewriter together back before computer, <laughs> when it was typewriting. <laughs> Tales are right. <laughs> uh, so we met in class together there, um, knew each other, but became great friends. Began dating and um, eventually got married. So you met in high school, high yes. school sweethearts. Yes. And now you have two daughters. Two daughters, Maggie and Molly. So tell me about what it was like for you during kind of the evolution of this business. Truly, it was a shock at the beginning. Um, when he come in and, you know, proposed the idea of this, it took a little bit for me to kind of grasp. But you know, eventually I went to studying with him, doing our homework and I could start to visualize and see where this was going. And it was a big step for me to step away from my job mm -hmm. and to take this on with him that I wouldn't trade a minute of it now. Our kids get to do this with us, something that we're able to teach them hands-on now and just and be together doing it. grown tremendously from starting from scratch, not knowing if people would even take to it to now. We ship all over the country and we have stores that carry it as well. Ricky Waite is really cool. I first got to know her at a farmer's market in Warner Robins that we attended when we first started. And she wanted to use our oil to fry empanadas with. And she's like, I'd like to fry empanadas with your sunflower oil. And I was like, what in the world is an empanada? And she had explained to me it's a Panamanian dish. And, and I was like, OK, yeah, sure, you can fry in it, yeah. We are at my grandma's empanadas in Warner Robins, Georgia. So I started selling empanadas at our local farmer's market because I went to a farmer's market. And I ordered a couple of empanadas, and they were mediocre. And I said, this is not my grandma's empanada. So I came back home and I talked with the owner of our market, Jody Daly, and she got me set up. I met the farmers and a whole new passion unfolded. I met Clay through Jody. We have now bought hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons of Oliver Farms sunflower oil. It's so delicious, you know, and anybody with a palate can taste the difference in it. And it really complements the empanada and the Panamanian flavors that are coming through. It goes with everything that I believe in, the non-GMO, cold press, knowing your farmer, 
and I'm so lucky to have them as a local farmer here in Middle Georgia. We're about to check in with Jody, the market master here at the International Cities Farmers Market. We're gonna chat with her about the role that farmers markets play in connecting consumers with makers and farmers. How did the farmers market get off the ground? About 10 years ago, I moved here and there was no farmers market. So I started researching and found people that grow food and I found six of us to get one started. And then from there, we grew to about 30 to 40 vendors that I work with annually. So Clay was actually a vendor here at the market. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. He got started here. They were doing tastings. So when you saw Clay's oil, what made the light bulb go off that Ricky should be using his stuff? Well, I knew how she was cooking, and I thought, oh. And so I talked to him first to make sure that it was something that could be used for that product. And he said, yeah, that's absolutely doable. So. I think it's awesome that she's using it and selling it in her store. So in addition to being the market master here at the farmer's market, Jody actually also has a coffee shop called Bodega Brew. What made you decide to open up a coffee shop? I have a great friend who roasts beans up in, in Athens, Georgia, so we buy his coffee. And you are one of the folks who is using Clay's flour. Yes. And so you're using as much local product there. I mean, you're taking the philosophy of the farmer's market and you've just, yes. you know, I'm incorporated practicing what that. I preach. That's good. <laughs> More people should do that. Please. Yes, yes. <laughs> Be honest with you, I don't think I ever just stuck my finger in oil before and tasted it, you know. But once we started making it, I'm like, man, this tastes so good coming out and it's so so fresh. And you're like, man, there's no way I'd burn this for fuel. You know, this deserves to be on a plate somewhere. Go to the grocery store the vegetable oil, the canola oil, the corn oil, the soybean oil, they all look the same color. Ours, every one's a different color, and you can see that, you can smell it, you know. It's not stripped out, it's not taken away. Everything God put in it, I just take it out and put it in a bottle. We're gonna wrap up the episode here in Clay's home kitchen. And one of the things that I really wanted to illustrate is that these types of oils are not really meant only for a final drizzle on something. You can actively cook with them to impart wonderful flavor to a range of dishes. So you're gonna make something savory and something sweet. That's right, these oils can be used, we tell people oftentimes, just like you would any other oil, whether it's a butter substitute uh, for sauteing, salad dressings, for frying even. What we're gonna do today is saute some vegetables in it. I'm gonna use the infused sunflower with this squash and zucchini recipe. Awesome, and this is pretty simple. If I can do it, you, you, I guarantee you it's simple. <laughs> All right, so we've got the veggies chopped up there. What we're gonna do is take some of this Carol sausage buckboard bacon. It's got a beautiful seasoning on it. You can see that pepper. Oh, Lordy, yes. You're gonna smell it in a minute. Gonna take about two tablespoons of the infused sunflower oil and add that to the squash and zucchini. We have some great goat cheese from our friends at Silly Goat Dairy. I'm going to take the pecan oil, which has the high smoke point, and I'm just going to brush it on this old juicy peach right here. So how do you finish this off? Okay, what we're going to do is take these warm peaches. We're going to sprinkle some brown sugar, add a little cinnamon. So you finish off these peaches with a little bit of that pecan oil. Mm -hmm. That was gorgeous. 
What I love about this is that it really kind of brings these types of products back to the home kitchen. You know, this is something that you can easily make on a weekday and be able to use those beautiful artisan oils. So I appreciate you showing us some easy to make recipes. No problem, my awesome. pleasure. Thank you for joining me here in Georgia and I will see you next time. All right, I think we should eat this peach. Yeah, let's do it. There's more information on the makers featured in this series along with recipes and extra videos at wearetastemakers.com. Tastemakers was funded in part by In the hands of those who take pride in what they do, something unique can be created. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. and by Fleischmann's Yeast, and A.B. Mowry.